bishop. From the Greek. Biskopos. Meaning an overseer or one who sees over, literally looking on intently, or one who keeps an eye on others, the flock, the fellowship. In the church organized by Joseph Smith, the historical development of this office has been the most complex and the least understood. Smith first appointed general bishops with broad geographical jurisdiction. Only later did he introduce the possibility of local bishops for smaller geographical units such as wards and branches and a presiding bishop for the entire church. Again retrospective interpretations and changes in the historical record have muddied the story of this development. Joseph Smith was church president, and Hiram Smith was in the church presidency and also patriarch to the church, but choosing the bishop was left for the members' vote. Even the duties of a bishop were decided by common consent in the beginning of the Restoration. The office of bishop still continues in many of the various religious groups claiming Joseph Smith as their founder. Blessed Enos tells us the Lord promised him, Thou shalt be blessed, Enos 1, paragraph 1. Words matter, and this statement can be read in the future tense. Enos is not promised that he is blessed, but that in some future event or events he shall be blessed. If blessed is another name given to Enos by the Lord, then here is another wonderful revelation about Enos' relationship with God. These words could be punctuated, Thou shalt be blessed, meaning the Lord gave to Enos the new name blessed at the time of their first meeting. If so, then in the concluding verse of his record, Enos is telling us of the future time when the Lord will call him by the new name blessed while assuring him of the mansion which belongs to him in the Father's kingdom. Enoch was twenty-five years old when he was ordained by the hand of Adam, and forty years later, when he was sixty-five, Adam blessed him. Once the power came, that is, from the blessing, he saw the Lord, and he walked with him, and was before his face continually. And he walked with God three hundred sixty-five years, making him four hundred thirty years old when he was translated, TNC 154, paragraph 15. So, he is ordained, the first requirement, then he is blessed, the second part, which has the effect of him becoming continually before the Lord, the intended result of ordination. And Enoch lived sixty-five years and begot Methuselah, Genesis 3, paragraph 25. Enoch had been ordained to the priesthood but was not a father until he was blessed and entered the Lord's presence. Blessings Joseph Smith linked blessings with knowledge. He linked knowledge with obedience to laws. And if a person gains more knowledge and intelligence in this life through his diligence and obedience than another, he will have so much the advantage in the world to come. There is a law, irrevocably decreed in heaven before the foundations of this world, upon which all blessings are predicated, and when we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to that law upon which it is predicated. If we want a blessing, we must find the law upon which the blessing is predicated, and then follow that law. If we do, we get the blessing. There is a majestic simplicity to this orderly procedure. It is from such an understanding Joseph authoritatively declared God was no respecter of persons. Joseph's declaration made profoundly more sense than what other religionists were teaching. Joseph made this whole process of gaining blessings through knowledge a natural one that grew out of conformity with natural law. Of course, God ordained that natural law. This whole process is a gift from God. He set the bounds and terms by His grace. So if mankind elects to abide those conditions, they are entitled to receive the grace or blessing He promises. But it still remains a gift. King Benjamin explained this process of keeping commandments, receiving blessings, and remaining in God's debt in Mosiah 1, paragraphs 8 to 9. The term entitled is used here to make the point that once man has done his part, God will do his. Man will not go down the road only to find it closed at the end. God keeps his promises. Blessings of the Fathers Abraham wrote, Finding there was greater happiness and peace and rest for me, I sought for the blessings of the fathers, Abraham 1, paragraph 1. The blessings of the fathers he wanted to obtain was the original holy order. He wanted to be like the first fathers. Blood crying for vengeance 
blood crying from the ground is not the same thing as a person crying out for vengeance. Keep the context in mind. It is the blood that was shed upon the earth which cries out for vengeance, fairness, or retribution. Something unfair has occurred, and the cry of the blood upon the ground is a reminder of the injustice of it all. The ground is a reference to the earth, which has a spirit, intelligence, and is able to communicate, if a person were capable of listening. The earth is a female spirit, and she regards herself as the mother of men. This earth is offended when the men who are upon her kill one another or engage in any form of wickedness upon her surface. As she beheld the disorder and murder caused by that generation upon whom the flood was unleashed, she lamented, Woe, woe is me, the mother of men! I am pained. I am weary because of the wickedness of my children. When shall I rest and be cleansed from the filthiness which has gone forth out of me? When will my Creator sanctify me, that I may rest, and righteousness for a season abide upon my face? Genesis 4, Paragraph 20 even if the person whose blood was shed departed this earth forgiving those who made offense against him, yet would the ground cry out for vengeance because the earth has become filthy by reason of the killing that took place upon her. She, as the mother of men, regards the killing of men upon her as an abomination. She cries out. She is offended. She wants righteousness to appear on her, as has happened before. She longs that it be brought about again. When, instead of Zion, she has the murder of men upon her face, it is so great a lamentation by her spirit that the ground cries out for vengeance because of the atrocity. Book of Mormon as Covenant Nephi's power to seal his writings at the command of the Lord, and his obedience to that command, make his words binding on all. They become covenantal. Hence the reference to remembering the New Covenant, even the Book of Mormon, TNC 82, paragraph 20. It is not merely interesting doctrine, nor even prophecy, but has reached covenantal status by virtue of the priestly seal placed upon it by Nephi. Mankind ignores it at their peril. It is a great loss when it is defined as just another volume of Scripture. It was intended to be studied and followed as the means to reassert a covenant between man and God. By following its precepts, all can return to God's presence where they are endowed with light and truth and can receive intelligence and understanding. All are invited to make that return. Nephi lived it and, as a result, was able to teach it. All should follow his example and live it to be able to understand and then teach it. It is the doing that leads to the understanding. If I had to say one thing will do more to bring a person into harmony with the Lord than any other thing it would be this take the Book of Mormon seriously. I have assumed it is an authentic and ancient text written by prophetic messengers whose words ought to be studied for how they can change any person's life. Though all the world may treat it lightly, I have tried to not do so. For that I believe the Lord's approval has been given to an otherwise foolish, vain, error-prone and weak man. Take the Book of Mormon seriously. Apply it to yourself. Not as a means to judge others but as a means to test your own life. It is one thing to evaluate our circumstances, which the book compels us to do, but we needn't go further than to realize our terrible plight. From that moment the warning should work inside ourselves to help us improve within, see more clearly our day, think more correctly about what is going on, and act more consistent with the Lord's purposes. The Book of Mormon is not merely a book of Scripture. It is the preeminent volume of Scripture for this day. All other volumes of Scripture are vastly inferior to it. It is the covenant that mankind has been condemned for neglecting. It is the reason I have found him. For above all else, I have used the Book of Mormon to direct my thoughts, actions, teachings and understanding. He is inviting us, using the text of the Book of Mormon to find him individually, for ourselves. This book is the restoration of the Gospel. Unfortunately, most people have missed that. Nevertheless, it is true. Book of the Lamb of God The New Testament Bowels Greek Splachne Bowels or intestines, the heart, lungs, liver, etc. and refers to the inward parts, the internal organs, viscera. The heart, affections, and the seat of the feelings, 
as regarded by the Hebrews as the place of the tenderer affections, i.e., kindness, benevolence, and compassion. Often translated as tender mercies. Our bowels must become like Christ's, moved with compassion for others. Matthew 8, paragraph 3, and Mark 4, paragraph 2. This may only be imitative at first, but after it is informed by the experience, when one has acted consistent with his laws, what begins as imitation grows within to become genuine compassion for others. See also the glossary entry, Hardness of Heart. Branch When the word branch is used in Scripture, it should remind one of Christ's description of Himself in John 9, paragraph 10. Christ compared Himself to a true vine to which all must connect if they are going to bear fruit. Christ inspired prophecies about a coming servant. All should be His servants. For any of His servants to produce fruit they must connect with Him, the true vine. Life comes from that connection. All are preserved by Christ, nourished by His Word, and the sacrament prayers ask that we always have His Spirit to be with us. The vine and fruit refer to the family of God. The context is about becoming a son of God. Broken heart, contrite spirit. Repentance is accompanied by a broken heart and contrite spirit. When you turn to Him and see clearly for the first time how dark your ways have been, it should break your heart. You should realize how desperately you stand in need of His grace to cover you, lift you, and heal you. You can then appreciate the great gulf between you and Him, Genesis 1, paragraph 2. If you had to bear your sins into His presence it would make you burn with regret and fear, Mormon 4, paragraph 6. Your own heart must break. When you behold how little you have to offer Him, your spirit becomes contrite. He offers everything. And we can contribute nothing but our cooperation. And we still reluctantly give that, or if we give a little of our own cooperation, we think we have given something significant. We have not. Indeed, we cannot, Mosiah 1, paragraph 8. He honors us if He permits us to assist. We should proceed with alacrity when given the chance to serve. How patiently He has proceeded with teaching us all. We have the law, we have the commandments. Still we hesitate. Still He invites and reminds us, repent. Come to Him. Do what was commanded. The law is fulfilled, and He is its fulfillment. Look to Him and be saved. The heart that will not break does not understand the predicament we live in. The proud spirit is foolish and blind. Our perilous state is such that we can forfeit all that we have ever been by refusing Christ's invitation to repent and turn again to Him. If man will finally surrender his pride and come forward with a broken heart and real intent, returning to his Father, he will joyfully receive Him, see Luke 9, paragraphs 13-14. There is joy in heaven over everyone who awakens. Weakness is nothing, for all are weak. It is a gift, given to break one's heart. A broken heart qualifies man for his company. Whether a leper, an adulteress, a tax collector, or a blind man, he can heal it all. But what he cannot do, and man must alone bring to him, is that broken heart required for salvation. The purpose of putting a man in such a dependent state before God is not to find out whether God can take care of him. God already knows what a man needs before he should even ask. But the man will, by becoming so dependent upon God, acquire a broken heart and a contrite spirit, always quick to ask, quick to listen, quick to do. Vulnerability makes a man strong in spirit. Security and wealth make a man incorrectly believe in his independence from God. He wants his disciples to be dependent upon him. He wants them praying and grateful to him for what he provides. He wants them, in a word, to become holy. The Book of Mormon gives account after account of encounters between mankind and God where the only qualification was a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Those who do not have the required broken heart and contrite spirit come away saying, The Lord maketh no such thing known unto us. 1 Nephi 4, paragraph 2. In the quiet service for others, when our minds finally come to rest on the only one who can save us, we can find that peace where the Lord comes to us and speaks words of comfort. He is real. He exists, and He comforts those who come to Him offering a broken heart and contrite spirit, and to none other.
See also the glossary entry, Hardness of Heart. Call, called, calling. Service to others, which precedes being chosen by God. In 3 Nephi 5, Christ calls Nephi by name. Being called by name by the Son of God is important. When God calls someone by name, they are not merely being addressed. In the instant the Lord calls out their name, they are called. That is, the Lord will never speak one's name to them unless He calls them to a work. When the Lord spoke to Nephi, the Lord both called Nephi's name and called the bearer of that name to do a work. Nephi knew it. The crowd knew it. All present would have understood that Nephi just became the chief prophet of those present. Nephi knew what he had to do, for the servant who had been called to stand above his peers needed to descend below them. Pride is unthinkable when in the presence of such a meek and humble figure as our Lord. It is required that the balance be restored. Nephi, who had been made to rise, had to choose, on his own, to descend and abase himself. Note that a person cannot receive an ordinance without also having their name stated. Why do you suppose it is necessary to first call out the name of the person before they receive an ordinance? Why would the Lord's instruction require a person to be called first? Though they are submitting to the ordinance voluntarily, why call their name? Does it matter if the full legal name is used? That is done in some churches, of course. But does it matter? If the Lord called Joseph by name at the time of the first vision, which he did, what name do you suppose was called? See Joseph Smith History Part 2, Paragraph 4. Was it Joseph Smith, Jr.? Or was it Joseph? Or was it that name used by his most intimate friend at the time? Whenever a name is given by an angel in an appearance to parents, the name is always the first name, or the name their friends would call them. See, for example, Luke 1, paragraph 3 or Luke 1, paragraph 5. Similarly, when the Lord calls a man's name, he uses his first, given name. See 1 Samuel 3, paragraph 8 and Exodus 2, paragraph 3. The Lord does not use formal names but uses intimate names when addressing his servants. Calling and Election After a person has faith in Christ, repents of his sins, is baptized for the remission of his sins, and receives the Holy Ghost, by the laying on of hands, which is the first comforter, then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness and living by every word of God. The Lord will soon say unto him, Son, thou shalt be exalted. When the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man will find his calling and election made sure, then it will be his privilege to receive the other comforter, which the Lord hath promised the saints, as is recorded in the King James Version of the Testimony of St. John, in the fourteenth chapter, from the twelfth to the twenty-seventh verses. Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 150 Words of Joseph Smith, page 5. See John 9, paragraph 7 to 9. I've not said much about calling and election. I think focusing on that topic is a mistake. It will take care of itself if you can get the second comforter. Joseph Smith said, First key, knowledge is the power of salvation. Second key, make your calling and election sure. Third key, it is one thing to be on the mount and hear the excellent voice, etc., and another to hear the voice declare to you, you have a part and lot in that kingdom. Nephi speaks again with the Father's words, Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life, 2 Nephi 13, paragraph 4. This is the purpose of receiving the second comforter. Christ's objective, as a tutor, is to bring his followers to the Father. It is the voice of the Father which finally declares to his children they are assured eternal life. When the Lord promises a blessing, it is always tied to faithfulness and obedience. Even when promises are unconditional, such as in having one's calling and election made sure, years of faithfulness precede the promise. The promise is premised on the continuation of faithfulness and no one is relieved of the necessity of enduring to the end, even when their calling and election is made sure. The highest form of acceptance and redemption is to have one's calling and election made sure, to be washed and cleansed from sin every whit, 